This morning we're going to be continuing continuing in in part two of Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, the beautiful uh, story of our lives in the future. Isn't it kind of great? You know, what, Lord, what would you have me to do in the future? What's going to happen to my life? He lays it out right here for us in Matthew chapter 24. As we remember last week where we left Jesus, he was up on the Mount of Olives. He was talking to his, the disciples as, as they had asked them a, a, a question. And really what this, at the end of verse number 2, or we'll read, excuse me, verse 3. Let's read verse 3. And now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And so he began to talk to them about the things that are going to be happening that's going to be preceding the return of Jesus Christ. I believe those uh, signs are being unfolded before our eyes daily, don't you? As it seems to be things are starting to ramp up and start to appear quicker before us than we've ever seen before. And as we made mention last week, the first of one of the signs that he was saying, he says, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And so he says, as a sign to you that you know the things I'm saying are true, he says there's going to be many deceivers that are going to come. And they're going to claim to be the Messiah, and they're going to seek to deceive many. As we talked on that last week, we see now, as he goes on in verse 6, he says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise up against nations, and kingdoms against kingdoms, and there will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places, and all these things uh, are the beginning of sorrow. I find it's interesting how it seems not only wars and rumors of wars are escalating on a daily uh, basis. Um, there's this fellow, Emmanuel Macaron, I thought that was an interesting last name, Macaron, uh, unveils over in a European the defense coalition, these 10 countries, 10 countries, which I find it's interesting, signed up a following for, by, with the French president to call, the, the, the pre, French president called for a, a European army. 10 countries came together to, to bring forth this European army because they see the, the, you know, the power of these other nations and they don't want to be left behind as they're preparing themselves for war. Britain f tells us that they fund research into drones. You never would think in warfare a while back that drones would be a big thing, did we? But now that it's a real part of our lives, these drones that decide who they're going to kill. A and Britain has found funded much research into this now as they're reaching into the technology of Northrop right down the way here. Northrop's technology that could unleash a generation of lethal weapons systems that requires, I find this is interesting, it requires little or no human interactions are being funded by the Ministry of Defense according to a new report. We're living in the last days. We're living in a time that as Jesus is saying, you're going to hear of wars, rumors of wars, and wars are going to be escalating. These things are going to be continuing. As you look at the world conditions as far as hunger and starvation and famines around the world, we're living in Southern California. We don't think of it too much, do we? But you, as you travel the rest of the world, the overpopulations of countries, the la lack of food that's around us it is enormous. And then as he tells us also, earthquakes in various places. The earthquakes that are escalating at a rate that are beyond what we could ever imagine. In the last 10 years, the report tells us it's at a higher rate that they could, that they ever have history, the number of earthquakes and the violent earthquakes that, that are happening. 
Just in the last year in 2018, the devastating earthquake in Nepal, how it just wiped out that city and so many very uh, large area where they're now left desolated. In verse 9, he said, and they will deliver you up to uh, deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And, and then many will be offended, will be betrayed one another, and will hate one another. Then many prophet, false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Again, I think it's very interesting. And as we'll be talking about the day of the end when Jesus Christ is coming back. But it, as it, you, we, you would think maybe 10, 15, uh, probably 40, 50 years ago, how is the gospel going to be preached around the world? You know, you, there, there's a whole big push, as you remember, for missionaries. If you're involved with churches, many missionary uh, groups, their whole push was for this verse right here, that all around the world that they're going to hear the gospels. And then in the 90s, the late 90s, there was something that was developed. It was really the came out of the government, was known as the internet. It wasn't even known as the internet back then. And then as it started to be developed in the 2000s, and I remember when we finally were able to, you know, somebody came along and said, hey, we could use this for the gospel. Let's see if we can get it on what is known back then as known as iTunes. It was brand new. And so a friend of mine actually developed what is known a fat sound, so it sounds like radio. He says, you know what you could do with that? You could stream the Pastor Chuck on, uh, on iTunes, and we could put a radio station now on iTunes. And I remember the first radio station that ever went on iTunes was a, a station known as His Channel. Most of you know it as a TV network now. And all, we were so excited. He says, you know what? We could do this across the country. People were able to listen to it. And then we discovered other start countries started uh, able to listen, have access on the Internet. And then before you know it, more countries. And now we're around the world with the Internet. This morning as we're streaming, we have people across the country watching Agape Chapel. The word of God is being preached around the world. And Jesus said, he says, to all nations, and he says, then uh, the end will come. These things are going to be happening around the world. But he also says in this verse, verse 12, he says, because of lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Lawlessness is, I don't know about you, the state of our country is in a place of lawlessness, where they're taking what we deem wants to be right, and now... It's called wrong. This past week, this uh, young woman who was running for, uh, while well, she was part of the, there at Berkeley, she was going to school up there, and she was part of the city, uh, I mean, the campus senate. You know, they would have things that they would vote on, what the student body could do and all that. And she happened to take a, her own stance because she believed in the Bible concerning you know, what is right between a man and a woman, and she made her stance to all that. And the whole, the whole campus came a, against her, calling that she was homophobic, and she was, you know, that all these things they had come against her because, you know, how dare you speak up or say anything, and all she was doing was just trying to, you know, voice her little voice that, no, I believe in what the Bible defines between a husband and a wife, what a man and a woman is. We're living in a world of lawlessness. This is just the United States. You go around the world, and this is the most civil country that there is in the world. And Jesus says, these things are going to be happening until I come. As you go verses, as verse 15 and through, you, you, you'll see the story, the abomination that leads to des desolation. You'll see the story uh, of the 
you know, really the tribulation period. And then down in verse number 32, you start seeing the story of the one of, I think, the greatest modern day miracle known to mankind is the restoration of the restoring of the nation of Israel in 1948. So Jesus said these things in the of what's going to be happening in the future, what's going to be happening right now for us. Because he spends some time at the end of chapter 24 and chapter 25 with one central message that he's repeating over and over again to his disciples. It's always important to understand who he's speaking to. He's speaking to his disciples. He tells them to watch and to be ready. It's obviously obvious that Jesus and his, his, his disciples of the church in each age that he want people to be watching for the return of Jesus and, and to be ready for his return. It's so important that we be looking for the return of Jesus even in today's life, our, the, the, the world that we live around, because it changes you. If you're looking for Jesus to come back this day, if you knew that he was going to come back before we have our agape feast tonight, wouldn't you be concerned about the people that you could reach out to? Concerned about our own lives, that our hearts were right before him? Jesus wants us to be thinking in the right way that this world is not my world, but rather than the kingdom of God is. If you argue that the church must go through the tribulation, there's many people that like to think that the church will go through the tribulation. And then you're taken away from the, the really the, the return of Jesus that he could come at any time. The church won't be looking for the return of Jesus or for the rapture of the church. What they're going to be looking for instead is for the tribulation and for the Antichrist and the things that will be happening. Christians would then be devised, you know, They'll probably be thinking about if I'm going to be going through the Antichrist, I got to figure out how I'm going to be able to buy and sell because I, I know what the Bible tells us about buying and selling. What do you have to do as you go through the tribulation? What are you going to need? You're going to need a mark, aren't you? You're going to have, a, have to have a way to be able to buy and sell. So Christians would be, you know, we'd be sitting there having a, hey, this afternoon at a meeting, we're going to have a meeting of how we're going to be able to store up our food because we're going to have to, amongst the Christian, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to buy and sell. There's many people, many false doctrine, I believe, that, that are speaking about where Jesus is going to come in the middle of the tribulation or at the end of the tribulation. But Jesus tells us as believers that we should watch and be ready. According to Daniel, we know. Do you know that? We know the day that the Lord Jesus Christ will return. Not the rapture of the church, but we know the exact day when Jesus Christ is going to return. As he tells us that he will return 1,290 days in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. 1,290 days after what? As we see in Daniel, after what is called the abomination that leads to desolation. The time that that beast comes to the temple of God, the new temple, and he sets himself up, and he sits upon the throne, and he demands to be worshipped at God, and that brings forth the wrath at that time. And he says, in 1,290 days after that, Jesus Christ is going to return. See, that can't be when the rapture of what we're looking for or the right time when Jesus Christ is going to come back for the church. Because notice what verse 36 of chapter 24 tells us. It tells us that, that but of that day, that day of Christ's return, he says, Knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but the Father only. This can refer to the this cannot refer to the day of Christ's return to the earth, but only can re really reference to when the church is taken off this planet. Nobody knows that day. 
Jesus wants us to live with the, our hearts open and our hearts excited that he could return today. Aren't you excited about it? Because every prophecy, everything that has been that was foretold about the rapture of the church and Jesus Christ is coming back has now been fulfilled. The word rapture simply means in the, in, in the Bible, it simply means that we'll be caught up. We'll caught, be caught up in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. I so, so often think about when that's going to happen, happen, what you're doing here on earth. You know, maybe I'll be in the bathroom combing my beautiful hair, you know, making sure everything's right in the right place or putting my shoes on or, or Ray and Corey be lead us in worship and we'll be enjoying the Lord. Wouldn't that be a marvelous time? All of a sudden, boom, we're gone. He says, nobody knows the, the time. Nobody knows that when that's going to happen. Because with that, if we knew, I think our lives would be changed. Our lives would be different. And then Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Jesus begins to exhort us to watch and to be ready. And he gives us a, a series of parables. In verse 42, watch therefore. For you know not what hour the Lord doth come. So he picks up in verse 36. He says, no man knows what's the, you know, the hour. He, you know, not even the angels in heaven, but the Father only. In verse 42, he, now he tells us to watch. For we know not what hour the Lord cometh. Then he gives us his first allegory concerning the master's house of verse 43. He says, but know this. That if a good man of the house hath known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered this house to be broken up. Therefore be also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the son of man cometh. If a, it, truly, if a man had only known what hour the thief would come, he's going to watch and be ready. I don't know if you've ever had anybody break into your home. I hope not. Or if anybody had broken into your car, it's a terrible thing. As I mentioned before, when Miss and I were first married, I, we had a, a Ford Pinto. I hope you guys probably lived those lives, a Ford Pinto station wagon. It was a country squire, I thought, you know, a little one. But I had my tools in the back and, you know, for work. And I remember, you know, saying goodbye to my wife and heading down to my car and looking at my car and I go, hmm. There's something look different about my car. Hey, my window smashed in. What happened? I, I don't, what happened there? Not thinking that, oh, somebody saw my tools and somebody broke my windshield and they went off with my tools that day. You know, if I knew when that thief was going to come, and this is the story. If I knew when he was going to come, I would have not only take my tools out of there, I probably would have parked my cell, car someplace else underneath some light or something. And he says, I would have been ready for that thief. And so how important it is for us to be ready. He goes on in verse uh, 45. He talks about when his master's return. Notice this. It says, who then is faithful and a wise servant whom his Lord has made made rule over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, so shall find doing. Verily I say to you that he shall make him ruler over, over all his city. And so here Jesus is talking about the faithful servant. So you ask me, you say, Terry, watch and be ready. What am I supposed to be doing? What am I supposed to be doing right now? Well, Jesus tells us that we should occupy until he comes, that we should be doing, that we should be doing the things of God. Somebody asked me, in fact, I was talking to Odin earlier this uh, today, and we're talking about some people that are, you know, ministry and those who, that we talk to that are just seemingly seem to be stuck in a rut. They, their life is just kind of blah. You know, they're not serving anymore. They're not doing anything. And I said, Odom, well, one of the things I try to encourage the people is the number of the days, because you don't know how many more days you got left. I mean, if God would tell you, what do you got, 10 years? You know, go to your calculator and number them out. You know, how many days do you have left? And sometimes that's a good wake-up call, right? But really, when joy comes, 
when in our life, isn't it joyful when we're serving? When we're doing things that God has given us to do, no matter what it might be. And this is what he's saying. He says that faithful servant is going to be, is one that's going to be giving out the meat in due season. He's going to be there, you know, blessing people, helping people, reaching out to people, and doing what you can be doing. And you're going to be busy serving God and the things that you do. You know, serving God, I don't know what, what it might be in your life. You know, what the Lord has given you to do. But he's given each and every one of us something to do. I got a note. My wife and I got a note from our daughter-in-law here this past week. And she put a scripture on top of the little card she sent us. And in it, just, it said that beautiful verse. And whatsoever you do, do wholeheartedly unto the Lord and not the men. As we serve the Lord... We serve him with gladness, and if we go off to work, if we're cleaning the house, if we're you know, inviting people over, we're doing it in the name of Jesus. Verse uh, 48, he talks about his, the evil servants. It says the Lord delays his coming. He says, but if that evil servant shall save the, in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and, and shall be, begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink and with the drunkards. The Lord of that servant shall come in that day and when he looketh not for him in the hour and in an hour that he's not aware of that he should cut him asunder and point him his por portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know when you look at this is Jesus again is speaking to who? The disciples. He's speaking to the church. And he says there's, there's an attitude that could happen to the church, to believers, and say, you know what, I've heard about the second coming of Jesus Christ for a long, long time. You know, doesn't the Lord delay his coming? One verse that you could, verses that you could read along with this that speaks is, is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, where Paul talks about and gives a warning of those who say that the Lord has fallen asleep that the Lord delays his coming and the dangers that we have with that. And I find it's interesting how they smite his fellow servants. Really, they re ridicule other believers that believe in the return of Jesus Christ. And they begin to eat, drink, and be drunkard. They're no longer separate from the world. Rather, they become like the world. In the things and their and their attitudes, they still dress themselves as Christians, and they'll still go to the church, but their hearts are no longer living for God, seeking out for the things of the Lord. And it's a scary verse when you look at. It. He says, "He says the Lord of the servant shall come in a day." He says, "I'm going to come, I'm going to return." Isn't that what Jesus said in John chapter 14 to us? He says, "Let not your heart be troubled." You believe in God, believe also in, my, in me. I go away to prepare my uh, a mansion for you guys. But he says, uh, you know, I'm going to come again. And he says, I wouldn't have told you these things if it wasn't true. He says, I, this is going to happen. And, and he says, now you're back living for the world. You're living for, like you don't know me anymore. You turn your back upon me as he's speaking to the church. And we get this in the book of Revelation also. Where Jesus is walking in the midst of the, the candlesticks or in the midst of the church. As he talks to them and he encourages them to return to their first love. They're no longer seeking the Lord. Rather, because of their unbelief, they become slothful. And they're seeking the things of this world. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, it talks about diligence. And it talks about purity. He says, we are told that now we are the children of God, if we, it, it, and it has not yet been revealed that we shall be, that when uh, we know that when he is revealed, when Jesus comes back, we shall be like him, we, we shall see him as he is. When, we, when he, they were told that, or where John says, everyone who has this hope in him will purify himself even as he is pure. 
He says there's a purifying effect that happens to the believers as we look forward to the return of Jesus Christ. He says that when Jesus Christ comes back, he says, we're going to be like who? We're going to be like him. Our lives are going to be transformed, this body, this old crepit of body. I mean, I got aches and pains, believe it or not. I don't know if you, ever, you guys ever get aches and pains, but they come and get me every once in a while. I'm looking forward to that day. When this body is changed, it's transformed in a moment of a twinkle of an eye. He says that with that hope, with that hope, it says it purifies you. You want to live for Christ. You want to do things that are right because your king could come back any time and he's going to come back to receive his bride, the church, at any moment. Jesus continues to emphasize this as you move now to Matthew chapter 25. He gives another beautiful story for us to look at as Jesus is emphasizing the importance of us being ready as we have here the story of the ten virgins. In verse 1 of chapter 5, he says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And the five of them were wise, and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps, and they took no oil with them. But the wise took oil and their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight they were, they, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us your oil. For, your, uh, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell, uh, them that sell and buy for yourself. And they went and buy, uh, they, while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in. To him that, uh, to the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily, or else truly I say to you, I know you not. Watch, therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. As you look again at verse 10. And I love it where it says, And when the cry went forth. You know, in the scriptures, we don't have really the audio version. But the scripture does paint a picture for us. So there was a cry. There was a loud voice that went out and says, he says, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Beautiful. Somebody was heralding and making this known to everybody. And he says, Those who were ready went in. And then in verse 13, the exhortation he says therefore for ye know neither the day nor an hour where the son of man cometh that verse we need to watch therefore and be ready as you look at these verses in Matthew chapter 24 and 25 it speaks about events Jesus said as he what there on the Mount of Olives his disciples came to him as they were he wanted to impress Jesus about the building of the temples and the, the buildings around them. There were ooh and an ah and of this great building that Herod, uh, you know, Herod had built. But Jesus brought them to something I think is so important. He brought it to the spiritual condition of their heart. And as he's telling them about the events that are going to be happening in their world, as we talked about how Jesus said, uh, you know, this big building that you're talking about and all of its construction and everything, it's going to be all knocked down. And in 70 A.D., this huge temple and all of its buildings were destroyed in 70 A.D. as Titus came rolling in. The really, to me, to prove the, the accuracy of the prophecies concerning Jesus. But that's not the only one he spoke about. He spoke about our times, the end times, and the events that are going to be happening in our world. As we look at it, our world around us, Jesus says that we as believers, we should be watching. Not to be caught up in the things of this world. You know what the cares of this world does? 
as we saw in the scriptures that here. Jesus talked about it in the parables, didn't he? About the seed that fell upon the thorns. What happened to that seed as it tried to grow? It got choked off. He says, the cares of your living for this world, it's going to choke, uh, choke off. And then when a bridegroom comes and you're looking and say, oh, my goodness, I don't have any oil. I'm going to have to run out to the city and buy some oil. And when the bridegroom comes, you're not ready. You go knocking on the door and say, hey, let me in. I got some oil now. He says, you know what? I never knew you. Isn't that a, a tragic uh, verse there where he says, you know, I, I know you not. I don't know you at the end of verse number 12. It doesn't say I never loved you. He says, I don't know you. You're not part of the family of God. And may our hearts be ready, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit, having the oil ready to serve God at any time, our hearts filled, looking for the return of Jesus. He says, they that were ready, what happened to them? They went in. They were able to enjoy. And I pray that as we go forth this week and we enjoy family and friends and holidays and everything else, that we won't lose sight that Jesus Christ might come back this Thanksgiving Day. Amen. Wouldn't that be great as we look forward to the soon return of Jesus Christ? Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer? Is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches through the lowest hell. The guilty fair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win his every charm. Amazing. 